like that at the end. So you can go ahead and be seated. Say hi to somebody as they're bringing some things forward here and getting everything set. My message has... Good thing you're big and tall. My message has everything to do with what we've just been talking about today. And so I just want to go into it. My message title today is called Finally Free. Finally Free. Now, I know that we're all wearing our, our flag shirts and everything, but it's not, it's not really a message for the United States. It, it's really more of a message for us in the room, those, wa uh, those watching online. It's about freedom in our hearts because, you know, if you're in prison, you've got, you've got brick walls, you've got stone walls, you've got, you got gates, you've got bars, you've got all that around you. But there's also a prison that happens in our hearts. And that's a prison that will hold you forever if you let it. And I really do mean that. I, 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 I'm not just saying that. I know a lot of people, and everybody else, if we said raise your hand, if you know somebody like this, could, could probably a whole room would raise their hand. But if you know somebody who's like 50, 60, 70, 80 years old, and they're still in a prison. A prison that may have started way back in their teens, maybe way back in their preteens, maybe even beyond that. Maybe it started in their 20s. Maybe it was happened while they were married. I don't, I don't know what happens, but we, we, we actually have like lots of little prisons that the enemy likes to put us in. But I actually do believe that God wants us free, like completely free. And though it is a struggle because we live in a war zone, that's a struggle. We have this flesh, and that's difficult. You'll never be free from the flesh until you die or he comes back. But one day it's going to happen. One day it will happen. But until then, the enemy is going to try and put us into our little prisons. A prison that, that looks like fears. It looks like wounds. It looks like addictions. It, 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 it looks like depression. It looks like loneliness. And it looks like on and on and on and on. Anxiety. Lately on, on seek nights, for, for whatever reason, I've just sensed, and I actually sensed it right over here as Tina was up here praying again. I sense that we're, we're, there's a lack of peace, even in Christians right now. And I know, you know, that's, that kind of makes sense because that's what the enemy's doing right now. He's trying to steal our peace. He's trying to bring anxiety into our lives, fear into our lives. And I'm just telling you, it's a prison. It's a prison. And the more you watch the news, the more you pay attention to all the drama that's going on in the cities and out in the streets and, and with our presidential campaign coming up, the more you watch all of that, the more literally you just get anxious. You're just thinking, these are our choices? What's, what's happening in the world right now? What's, and, and then you've got all the wars and rumors of wars that are happening. But if we don't deal with the root of what's got you in prison, you'll never really get out. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you today, I'm going to show you today uh, three really main big stages of freedom. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not drilling down into what your thing is. I'm talking about three main stages of freedom that we all have to go through. And I think that just seeing some of these stages are going to help you. They really are. But I will say this, and, and this is from, from knowing this, from going through this myself. In order to get free, you've got to go through these stages. You've got to go through multiple layers of freedom. I'll talk about that in a moment. Very seldom, I don't want to say never, very seldom does freedom come just boom and it happens. I believe in miracles 100%. And I've seen people set free. So one of our own pastors was set free from alcoholism. Like that. Like that. It was years ago. If you're new, it was years ago. It was sorry. Just yesterday. No. Set free just like that. And and that doesn't normally happen, but but we all know that it can. We all know that 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 healing sometimes, even in the Bible, healing sometimes is like this process. Physical healing, it can be a process, but it's supernatural all at the same time. But sometimes it just boom, it just happens. And and there it is. But you know what's interesting is even though when it happens like that, 
You can be delivered from an addiction. But what's interesting is that sometimes the root is still there. And, and that, that could be a real serious problem. Because that, that root can open up the door to that addiction. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but a lot of people who have been addicted to something, if they break free of that, sometimes their flesh will want to go get addicted to something else. They call it an addictive personality, but I call it there, there's something, there's a hurt, there's a wound, there, there's, something that's, there's something that's causing that. And, and maybe, it's, maybe it's in the mind. And I, and I do want to I, I say to you guys, we are, this is a church that believes in the power of God. We're also a church that believes in the power of counseling and care and, and mental health and all the different things that go with that. We, we actually believe that sometimes uh, medication might even be necessary. But don't self-medicate. We live in a self-medicating generation. And a lot of things that are being self-medicated are just prisons that you're, you're in. And you can get free of that without the medication, without the drugs, without the alcohol, Without the marijuana, you can get free. You can get free. So three main stages. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up a story. It's in the book of Acts. It's from Acts 12. And, and a lot of you guys will know this story to some degree, but we're going we're gonna to break it down a little bit more. And I'm going to be honest with you. I, I listened to other preachers kind of talking about this story, but God just gave me something different, something more um, to it. And... Um, I'm, I'm pretty excited about this story now. So in Acts 12, it, it all starts out with James, the apostle, James, John, and Peter. They were all like Jesus' best friends. I don't know if you realize that, but he had the 12, but then he had these three. And really what we see is John was his best friend. John's the one that laid back on Jesus' chest during the Last Supper. And... Um, so he had these three, James, John, and Peter. James and John were actually brothers. They're all apostles. And James is the first apostle to be martyred. King Herod had him killed with a sword. It doesn't say if he cut his head off. It doesn't say exactly what he did. But he was killed by a sword in the prison. In the prison. And now what happens is Herod actually hears all the Jewish people saying, That's awesome. We love that. Yay. Yay. And so he says, I'm going after Peter. And he gets Peter and he throws him in jail. And Peter is about to be tried the next day, which means probably execution the next day. And Peter's right there in prison now. And it says that Peter is chained. And it also says that there are 16 guards watching him. 16 different guards watching him. And they seem to be posted at different spots within the prison. So Peter finds himself in prison. So let's look at Acts 12. I'm going to start at verse 6. I'm going to back us up for a second because I don't want us to miss this. You don't have this, by the way. But in Acts 12, verse 5, the verse right before this, it actually says that Peter was in prison and it says the church was earnestly praying for him. Now that's important because if we, if we miss that, we're going to miss that the miracle happened because the church was praying for him. The Bible didn't just throw that out there for no reason. It talks about James and it, and it talks about his, his death. And then it talks about Peter getting in prison. And all of a sudden you see this one line come across, but the church was earnestly praying for him. And then all of a sudden, verse 6 happens. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two change, ch chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the, shone in the cell. Aren't you glad that the light shines in the darkness? There is a light that all of a sudden shines in his prison. You need a light to shine in your prison. Whatever is in your heart, whatever cold, damp place is in your heart, whatever that root is, it needs to be exposed. A light needs to shine on it. He struck Peter on the side and woke him. Quick, get up, he said. He woke him and said, quick, get up. 
I want you to look at the urgency that's in the angel here. There's an urgency to what he's doing. First of all, have you ever had God just kind of strike you on the side? Dude, wake up. I feel like that's what God's doing to the world right now, to, to, to Christians right now. Look, the world is going to come to them kind of on their own terms, and, but it takes us to go after them. But if we're sitting here sleeping, if we're stuck in our prisons, we're stuck in our wounds, we're stuck in our hurts and our hangups and our habits and all these different things, and we, we can't seem to get out, and if we just sit there, we're never going to make a difference in the world. I will say this, you at least won't make the difference that you could have. I believe that there are different levels of us making a difference because until you're really free, you'll never make the difference that God has planned for you. There's a powerful destiny, I believe, planned by God for every single believer. And if we stay in our prisons, then we'll never fulfill it completely. And there are times where we will get some healing and it will feel like you're moving forward, but there's still going to be more layers. But I do believe that final freedom can come. I really do believe that. So let, let's continue here. So the angel, the angel, the angel strikes Peter on the side. Quick, get up. If you're going to get up, if you're going to get up, you have to stop blaming other people. Cannot keep blaming other people. This is going to be a really strong point of this message today. Because here's the thing. I believe that many people in this room, you've been put into a prison by somebody else who did you wrong. Like, it was them. They did it. And you're now in prison because of your hurts and your wounds. You're, you're wounded by them. It, it, it hurts. And, it, and it's real. I'm not making fun of anybody. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not in any way saying that it's not there. That's a wound, and it can put you in prison. And you can sit there, and it can drive you to, to react to things. It can drive you to addictions. It can drive you just become bitter. It, it has all kinds of forms that it fleshes itself out as. But you find yourself there, and it was somebody else's fault. But can I tell you something? You're not going to get out of it if you keep blaming them and if you keep having a pity party. I'm speaking bold. I, I realize if you just got hurt, if you just got hurt, I know this word can be kind of tough, and I'm, I'm sorry. I, I do have compassion. I really do for where you're at. But if you have been hurt for longer than a month, <laughs> you got to start letting it go. And I, and I know that's not easy, but some of us carry these burdens for years and years and tens of years and 20s of years even. And, and you're hanging on to these things, and, and it's time to let it go because, because they're not going to get you out of the prison. Some people in here today, you're upset and you're angry with somebody who's not even living anymore. They cannot come to you and ask for forgiveness. And so you've got to get yourself out of there. You've got to quit the pity party. You've got to turn to God. And you've got to raise yourself back up. You've got to get up. And the angel, I love it, because the angel is not just coming, hey, hey, get up. Hey, hey, come on, man. We're going to go. Come on, we're going to do it real slow and quiet. Come on. No, he's like, get up. Get up. we got to go. Let's go. Yeah, I'm, I'm, come on, right now. There's an urgency. There's an urgency. There's an urgency. And there needs to be an urgency on the inside of us to get free. And a lot of us, man, I don't know why. I don't know why we think that sitting in a prison is comfortable. We get used to it after a while. You get used to it. And it becomes like this. This is my world. This is what I know. And this is how. And, and we just kind of sit there and we stay in that prison. God wants you out of the prison. You'll never be completely free until you get out of the prison. You've got to get out. But you have to make a decision today or very, very soon, that you're going to get up. That you're going to get up. It's your first step. It's your first step. Step one to freedom is get up. Step one to freedom is get up. Now, look at Acts 12, 7. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said. And the chains fell off Peter's wrist. The chains fell off Peter's wrist. Why? Why? Because the angel walked in the room? Nope. It's because Peter got up. It was when he got up that the chains fell off of his wrist. 
He was chained with two chains, it said. I don't know if he was chained to the guards. It's hard. He was sleeping between two guards right there, and, and he's there, and I don't know if he's chained to them. He's chained to the wall. I don't know if he was chained. I don't know what it looked like. It could have had chains to his legs for all I know. But as soon as he got up, they broke off. When you get up, something is going to break. Something is going to break. For some of you, it's salvation. Salvation is actually getting up. You give your heart to Jesus Christ. You ask him to be your Lord and Savior. Suddenly, when you do that, something breaks. Something breaks. I can tell you what it is. It's sin and it's death that breaks off of you. Because the Bible says, whom the Son has set free is free indeed. The moment you are born again, you are actually free. All you have to do is get up. All you have to do is walk out of the cell. Freedom is already there. It's you own freedom. Freedom is yours. But you've got to take action. You've got to get out of the cell. You've got to take some steps. But you legally, believe me, legally, on the spiritual world, legally, you have freedom. You are free. You're completely free. And so those chains just suddenly fell off. Let me make this point before we move on. Don't wait for the chains to fall off. That's the problem a lot of people have. You're waiting for the chains to fall off before you get up. It doesn't work that way. By faith, by faith, you get up. It's faith. It's faith. God always, always uh, responds to faith. Always. It's amazing. His response to faith is quite extreme also. I mean, change is breaking off. That, that doesn't happen. That does not happen. None of us in here, if I, if I change you up physically, I mean, you're not going to be able to get out of it outside of a miracle. You, you, they, they, they don't just fall off. They're heavy-duty metal. They're not just going to fall off. But when you stand up by faith, anything is possible. In fact, all things are possible when you stand up in faith. Faith is going to be required. Faith is needed for you to get up because it's amazing. But here you are. Here he is in prison. Walls, 16 guards all throughout the prison. He's got two of them on each side of him. He's chained. The, guy, the angel says, get up. And guess what he does? He's obedient to the angel by faith. And as he gets up, the chains fall off. Obedience and faith. Obedience and faith. Faith and obedience. They will break the chains off. So let me ask you a question. What's your next step of obedience and faith so that you can be free. What's the next step? Don't worry about the big plan. What's the next step? What do you need to do? What do you personally need to do? And if we went around to everybody in this room, it'd probably be something different. I mean, it might be things like I need to pray more, I'm supposed to do this. But God is probably has spoken something to you that you need to do, and you've not been really, really obedient to it. I, I know what that's like. It was just like, like six months ago that I kind of went through that. God was telling me personally, I need you to spend more time with me. I need you to be like, radical about it. And I started getting really radical. And right now, standing here in front of you, I'm getting convicted again. Like, what happened to it? You need to stay radical. Not just get radical, you stay radical. And so this, these are the things that we, that we have to walk in obedience. What's he speaking to you? What's he speaking to you? Think about that. Think about that. And when we leave here today, start doing it. Start living it out. Unless you don't want freedom. And can I tell you, you do. You do. As one who has been locked up, and everybody in here has been locked up, I'm sure, by something at some time. But as one who is now free, you want freedom. You want freedom. I know it's comfortable with that pain and that suffering, and you love it when people go, oh, it's going to be okay. I mean, it's weird, but we love that kind of stuff. That's why when we're sick, we're like, oh, honey, can you help me? As soon as she leaves, you like turn on the TV and you're like, yeah, drinking your soda or whatever, you know. But we love that, that, oh, so funny. Step number two. Step number two is get ready. Step number two is get ready. Step one was get up. Step two, get ready. Acts 12, 8. The angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Put on your clothes and sandals. It, it's, it's wild because here's this story happening. And over and over it keeps telling, like the angel's telling him what to do. The, the angel really in this story, especially the way I'm interpreting it today, the angel represents God. It wasn't Jesus. It wasn't God. This was an angel sent by God. But angels are messengers from God. 
And so the angel is being the messenger of God, and he says, quick, get up, now get ready. Put your clothes on. Get everything, get everything together. Come on, get, get ready. Get ready, listen to me, get ready for the breakthrough. Get ready to break out of here. When we get ready, here's what it looks like. Getting ready looks like you become a disciple of Jesus Christ. You start going to church, and there's nothing going to stop you from going to church. You're going to go on a regular basis. You're going to start going to, to, maybe if you're a brand new Christian, you're going to start going to following Jesus. Uh, you're going to start going to seek night. You're going to start going to celebrate recovery because you're wanting freedom in your life. You're going <laughs> you're, you're to go through all of these things because you want this breakthrough. You're going to join a small group. Come on, small group leaders, where are you at? You're going to join a small group because freedom happens when we connect with one another. Real freedom. The, the Bible actually says if you want healing, confess your sins one to another. Woo, that's like, whoa. You ever been in a small group and they said, tell me your top three sins? It's like, wow. <laughs> I've never been in one quite like that. But I have been in some men's group where it's, where it's accountability type of group. It's tough. It's tough because you get real honest with one another. But man, that's where freedom begins to happen. It really is. Freedom begins to happen. Why? Because you're beginning to expose your sins. And freedom can start to happen. You expose it to God. You expose it to others. Only expose your sin that pe to people that you love, that you trust, that have your back. You don't need to expose your sin to anybody else. Always know that. Always, it's just wisdom. It's just wisdom. But there are people. There are people. You have to find them. And you find them by going to these groups, by coming to church, by going to groups. You find the people who are with you by connecting with them. But if you're stuck in your prison and you're unwilling to talk to anybody, unwilling to just kind of come out and, and say hi to people, and you're just not, if you're just stuck there, then it's going to be hard to find that freedom. Because freedom really does happen when we connect with others. It's not only Jesus. He's the one that, that ultimately sets us free. But it's connecting with other people where we really start to see some breakthroughs happen too. So we've got to put on our clothes. We've got to get on our sandals. We've got to get ourselves ready. So notice, he's still in the prison. Still in the prison. The chains have broken off. Is he free? Not completely. But at least there was a step that was made. There was a step of freedom that happened because he got up. Now he's getting himself ready. Now he's learning about the word of God. Now, now he's, he's preparing for the breakthrough. Because if God just gave you the breakthrough, it's like, it's like giving an overdose of chocolate to a little kid. You're going to have a problem on your hands. They don't really know how to manage it. They don't know how to control it yet. They're just going to eat the whole thing at one time. And a, and a breakthrough without some wisdom being poured out into you, without you understanding the grace and the power of God, without you understanding his love for you, without you understanding who you are in Christ, with, without those kinds of things developing in you, it, it's, it's hard. It's really hard for that breakthrough. And many times that's what God is looking for. He, he will give you levels of freedom. And so we've got to get ready. You have to get ready for the breakthrough. Here's a question I got about that one. Are you getting ready to break out or are you just sitting there in the mess? Getting ready is on purpose. Everything we do with Jesus is on purpose. It's on purpose that you come to seek night on Wednesday nights. Very seldom is it just like, like I don't know, like easy. We're all busy. We all got things to do. Can I be honest with you? There's times as the pastor, I've not wanted to come. I'm certainly glad I did, but I'm like, man, we've got so much going on. I've got to do this. Gotta... Okay, let's go there. And, and so we go. Years ago, I've, I've said this, I said this probably a while ago, but years ago, my wife and I were going to another church and, and we, we, were, uh, we weren't pastoring or anything like that. We're just, we're just attending. We're, we're young believers um, with, with maybe a couple of kids. And um, it would be Tuesday night. And man, we're just, I think it was Tuesday night, Tuesday night. And we're just tired. You know, we've been working. She's been with the kids all day long. I've been working. And I'm just like, ah. Oh. You know, you run home, you try to eat. You know, you guys know what it's like when we got meetings here at the church. You're, you're hurrying and you get there. But man, when we would go, it was just, I remember over and over going home from there going, man, I'm sure glad we came tonight. I really remember saying that. And I think it's the same thing that happens when you go to seek. You're just like, whew, I needed that tonight. I mean, I didn't want to go at first, but man, did I need that. And I'm so glad that I went. Some of you, man, you need to grow and you need to be at the following Jesus class. 
Like you need to get the foundations in you of, of, of God, of the church, of Jesus Christ, what salvation looks like, what worship is, why do we give offering? All these different things that are just basic to some of us, but it's so necessary that you understand them correctly, that you understand them correctly. And so there's all kinds of things that we offer here for you to get free, for you to connect with people, for you to grow for you to get yourself ready so that you can go to the next level. Step three, walk in your authority. Walk in your authority. I've, I've learned personally that you don't understand walking in your authority until you really start to try to do it. And, and it's a process. You kind of feel like a little kid, like a baby, you know, trying to walk, a two-year-old trying to, trying to walk at first. You're trying to understand the authority that we have in Christ and, 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 and try to get that and try to take out that sword and actually use it against the enemy, the word of God, and begin to use it and grab the shield of faith. And, and you're, trying, you're trying these different things, and, and it feels kind of clumsy, but when you get stronger with it, everything begins to happen. I don't know if it was a precursor in my life. Again, I, sometimes I repeat these stories, and I know I've told this story, but it fits so well here. I, I don't know. I don't know what it, why it happened this way in my life. But at about ten years old, my dad and I were in the car, and I believe I was going to the doctor because I was getting like like um, allergy shots at the time. I think that's what was happening. We're going to the doctor. And, and my dad always had Christian radio on. And so it was always preaching, teaching, that type of thing. And I remember it being on in the car. And the guy must have said something about rebuking the devil. I, have, I, I just assumed that's what it was because I said, Dad, I'm 10 years old. I said, Dad, how do you rebuke Satan? I might have said Satan or the devil. And he just said, you just say, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke you, Satan. To this day, it hits me because I'm driving, I'm in the passenger seat and, I, and I'm in the front and I, and I look out the window. He's over here, my dad. And I said, in the name of Jesus, Satan, I rebuke you. There wasn't even, I mean, I'm young. There wasn't anything that I even was like rebuking him over. I just thought I had a question and so I said it and the power of God filled our car. And we just kind of begin to weep, both of us. Uh, almost like I'm just doing right now. It's just like, whew, there was this whew, anointing that just came in the car. Ten years old. Ten years old. And I don't know if that was God just saying, I'm calling you. I, I have no idea. Because I went through a number of years where I was just kind of like any other kid. I grew up in church. There wasn't anything powerful really, really, really happening. I had people say that there was wisdom on me, but, you know, I'm young. I, I, didn't, I didn't know. But I think God knew. God knew my purpose, knew my calling. And I'll tell you, there, there's, there's no greater passion, I think, than what Tina and I have to see people be free. I, I really think that that's, that has become such a passion. It's to get, we, I think that we, at least me, I, I thought it was going to be to prepare the church for the end times. And there's no doubt that that's part of it. But that seemed like that's it. But man, over the last number of years, there's this whole thing happening on the inside of me about people getting free, about lives being changed, that, that whole heal, grow, rise thing. Like it's even unfolding for me. Like I'm seeing it more and more and more. And if we're not healed, if we're not ready to move, then I'm just telling you, we'll never rise. You really won't. You've got to get yourself ready. There's a season of getting ready. You will not rise to your full potential until you get up and until you get ready. Until you get ready. Now, step three, walk in your authority. The angel tells Peter in, in verse eight, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. Get up, get dressed, wrap your cloak around you, follow me. The cloak always represents authority. 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 You guys remember Elijah? Elijah was a prophet. He was used powerfully by God. I mean, like, freaky powerfully. Literally could call down fire from heaven. And not just one time. He did it multiple times. 
Miracles, signs, wonders moved through Elijah. And it was powerful. Elijah wore a cloak. And I believe that that cloak, without a doubt, represented his authority in God. He understood his authority. He walked in his authority. And when he called on God, he knew something was going to happen. Something was about to break forth. And so we have to walk in that authority. It's amazing that in this story, these three steps all of a sudden popped out. You got to get up. Once we get up, the chains fall off. You got to get ready. You need to be discipled. You got to grow. You, you can't just sit there. You know, people come to church. I've, I've seen it. People come to church and they leave and they'll do it for 25 years and they never grow. I'm abs- it just amazes me. Like, why do, you, why do you come to church and not really want to change, not really want to become Christ-like? Why? Why? There's, I mean, let's grow. Let's change. Number one, you need healing. I need healing. First of all, let's get healed. There, there's great joy in being healed, believe me. There, there's no joy in, in, in wallowing in the mud and, and saying, poor me all the time and being miserable. And people get addicted to that misery. It's amazing, but they do. They get addicted to that, that wanting the strokes and wanting the pats on the back and wanting people to say, it's going to be okay, it's going to be all right. You got this, come on. And they get addicted to that. But it is so much better, so much greater to walk in freedom and not need that kind of stuff anymore. And to be free of that because you've been healed on the inside. And so we get up and we walk out and then there's this whole thing about, about this cloak. Grab your cloak. The Bible, I've always said this, but the Bible doesn't say things like this just because he's just saying, hey, get your stuff and we're going to go. He could have just said that. He could have just said, get dressed, let's go. No, there's steps to it. There's steps to healing. There's steps to our growth in Christ. There's steps to learning how to walk in our authority. So here's the thing. If you don't know who you are, if you don't know whose you are, you won't walk in authority. Everybody, probably 95% of the people in here have heard that statement before. You got to know whose you are and you got to know who you are. And and we get that and we hear it and and we believe it, but we don't really understand it in ourselves. Our our spirit has not come alive to it. We, we, we We really don't get it. But that is where the miracles can begin to happen. That's where the enemy will really begin to flee from you. The, you already have authority over the enemy, just as a believer. The Bible says to submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. So in every area of your life, you need to submit. And then you need to resist the devil, pray, push him back, and he will flee. But there are levels to that authority. There's because you've got to understand the authority. You have to understand who you are in Christ. You have to understand that it really is Jesus that has the authority, but it, his authority moves through you whenever we do what? Whenever we speak Jesus, just like that song said this morning. I speak Jesus. I speak Jesus. I speak Jesus. And if you have not been discipled, if you're not growing in the Lord, you're not really going to understand what that even really means. I speak Jesus over a situation. I speak by faith in the name of Jesus that this thing is going to move, that this mountain in front of me is going to move. I speak it by faith. When you speak it by faith and you speak it with authority, I'm telling you, every time that we lay hands on people, you can literally sense the power of God moving through you and into them. If they're open. If they're not open, it's interesting, but it literally bounces back. And it seems to like come back. It's like they're, they're not open. There's a wall there. There's some, something's not going through. You can sense these things. You can feel these things because of the authority that's been given to you, the, the giftings that, that have been given to you. Okay, now Peter's up. He's moving, right? He's got his cloak. He's got everything that, that he should need. And I, and I love this because here's, here's what it says. We're going to read verse 8 again, and we're going to go all the way to 10. It says, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And the angel told him, uh, Uh, The angel told him, Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. I thought I was free. The chains fell off. 
I'm, I'm, I'm out of the cell. I thought I was free. And now all of a sudden, there's another gate. I thought I was free. Remember, I was talking about there's layers to our healing. There are layers to our healing. And until you get to the gate that leads to the city, you're not really free. I don't know if you've ever been in a jail before. I've never been in jail in that sense, but I've ministered in jails um, a, several times. And it's really wild because it's, it's a little bit scary. But when you're, when you're going in, you know, you're just kind of like, whoa, you know, this is, this is crazy. We're going in. And, and you go in and guess what? You go through multiple gates, multiple entrances, between rooms. You walk into a room and the door goes behind you. And then you're locked into this little room. And then all of a sudden, this one opens. And you can go out there. And it's little, it's step by step by step until where I was going in, in Farmington until you finally get to the room where, where the prisoners are going to be coming in. And you're going to have a worship service. It's, it's powerful. And these guys have some level of freedom. But guess what? They're still in the prison. They've actually been given some level of freedom because they have been acting on their best behavior so they're able to come out of their prisons, actually walk by themselves. Of course, people are watching, but they, but they walk by themselves and they come into the room. And it's just like people coming into church. It's just, you know, they all come in at different times and, and they come in and we have worship. And then when we get ready to leave again, we're going back through all these gates. And you have to walk back through and you got to check out with the person. And there's gates stopping you everywhere. There are levels to your freedom. Sometimes God can do it overnight. Most of the time he won't. And so you'll get this sense of freedom. And all of a sudden, God will peel back another layer on you. And, and he'll expose something else in your life. What I love about God, though, is he's always so gentle about it, though. He, he's very, he's very, he's concerned about you. He never does it to harm you, to hurt you. He does it because he loves you. And sometimes he has to bring discipline. Sometimes he has to hit you on the side and say, get up. Get up. Come on. You know, he's got to, I mean, it says he struck him on the side. I went through other versions of the Bible. He struck him on the side. There was an urgency. And God will do that to us. Get up. There's something else I got to show you. Take a look at this. You've got a bunch of freedom here. But look, here's something else. There's another gate in front of you. Until you get free, until you go through that gate, I can't use you. Not, not the way I want to. There's, there's more. I want to use you in a greater way. Oh, there's stuff back here that you've done, and it's awesome, and it's amazing. But there's more. But there's more. And this is what God will do in us as believers. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. It's not a, it's not a bad thing. I know it, it kind of a, you just want to be free all at one time. We're not going to be completely until we're finally in heaven. So just, just go through it step by step by step. Look at verse 10. They passed the first and second guards, and they came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. When they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. I don't know if you saw that. As they approached the gates, the gate just opened. Just supernaturally opened. Can I tell you something? The gate was motion activated. As you walk toward the gate, the gate opens. A lot of us, if this is the gate, a lot of us are like, <sighs> imagine if you walked up to Walmart and, and you see there's a door right there and you just stood there at the edge of the, edge of the parking lot like, oh, I, can't, I can't get in. How, it's how, do I, how do I get in? <sighs> I don't know. So you sit down. And we just sit here, walk toward the door, it opens, motion activated. Freedom for your life is motion activated. You have to walk toward the gate, you have to get up, it's all action. You have to be obedient. Obedience always means you're about to do something. Faith without works is dead. Always moving, always activating. Always pushing forward. Always walking toward the prison door. Always walking. Always moving forward. That's, that's, that's what God wants from our lives. Unfortunately, what happens is a lot of us feel that hurt, feel that pain, and yep, we just sit down and we just say, there's, there's no way. I, I can't get out. I'm just, I, I, don't know. I don't know. I don't know what to do. And it's amazing because we just sit there. We just sit there. 
God doesn't want that. God doesn't want that. There's an urgency to him getting you out because there's a purpose for your life. There is. I, I thought about it the other day. I was, I was sitting on, the, on my back deck, and I was just out there just kind of probably studying, meditating. And I, and I thought, you know, even if the purpose for your life was to see one person come to know Jesus, like you had, there was no other reason that Jesus put you on earth but for that one other person. Man, that would be worth it. That would be worth it. I can tell you there's more than just that, but that would be so worth it. Like if, if my life helped someone else come to know Jesus, if my life was meant to just love on people, like, man, I'm just, I'm just my, my wife is good about this. She's an encourager. She, she loves on people. If you get a text from my wife, it's going to have hands going up in the air. It's going to have smiley faces. It's going to have little campfires going. It's going to have what, whatever's mood, whatever mood she's in. I watch her. I, I watch her. Uh, we, we could be sitting there in the kitchen, nothing going on, and she'll be on her phone. And, and if you just watch her face, I'll sh she'll be looking, sitting there. Like, <laughs> it's fine. She does. She just... I can, every every thought is like coming out of her, and it's and it and it's just there, and and so maybe your gifting is is to encourage people, to love on people. Maybe some of you are administratively gifted. Can I tell you? Do you understand that the gift of administration is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Powerful, so needed in the church, leadership the ability to lead others, the ability to put things together. Like, we can all come up with, let's have a big event. That sounds great. You know how much work goes into every event that we do here? Organization that goes on behind the scenes? Finding people to help? Finding, you know, what, what, what do we need to buy? How does this thing work? Call this company. Let's get a hold of that thing. I mean, even like the Harvest Fest that we do, there's a lot of work that goes under that. There's barbecues, there's blow-up games, there's tables, there's tablecloths, there's lights, there's electric. There's on and on and on and on just to make something happen. Cones have to be put out. Where's the trash cans? We've got to have bags in the trash. All these little things that take place. It's the gift of administration that can, that can just think its way through all that when everybody else is like, oh, well, let's just go have fun. <laughs> and you need those people too. And that's why we come together. And we make, we make life enjoyable. We make life successful. God needs all of us. It's, it's, it's incredible. So here, I'm going sh to show you the three main stages. Three main stages again until we're finally free. This is what has to happen in order to be free. Number one is you have to get up. And guess what? When you look at get up, that's heal. When you say get ready, that's grow. And when you walk in your authority... That's when you'll finally rise. Heal, grow, rise. Never in my mind until this week had I, had I ever seen that before. Heal, grow, rise, of course, is our vision. That's what we believe in here. God gave us that vision 30-something years ago. And we're going to heal, grow, and rise. Heal them up, grow them up, raise them up. That's the words that were spoken to me some 30 years ago. Heal them up, grow them up, raise them up. I wasn't even in ministry. I didn't know what all that meant. I, I sensed something stirring on the inside of us. I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know how that would ever come to, come to pass. But that's what God's doing. That's what God's doing. Bow your head and close your eyes this morning. John 1, 9 I, this is a, such a great scripture. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, if we confess our sins, he will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's all you have to do is ask for forgiveness. You have to realize that you're a sinner, first of all. If you're going to ask for forgiveness, you've got to believe that. I am a sinner. I've messed up. It's our sin that actually keeps us separated from God. Jesus came from heaven to earth in order to reunite us with the Father, though. And the way he did that is he paid our penalty because the penalty of sin, believe it or not, is death. It's eternal death. It's, it's spiritual death. Spiritual death is you or whoever going to hell because you rejected God. 
That's spiritual death. Spiritual life is an eternity with God the Father in heaven. Forever and ever and ever and ever. Eternal life. Those two options lay before you today. Do you want to choose eternal life or do you want to choose eternal death? If you can today say, I am a sinner, and I believe that because of Jesus dying on the cross, because he rose from the dead, my sins are paid for. My sins are atoned for. My sins are forgiven because of his blood. It'll never be because of anything that you do. It's not because of works that we get saved. It's because of the blood of Jesus Christ and nothing else. And all you have to do is believe that in your heart and ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins. And he promises that if you will do that, you will spend an eternity with him and with the Father, and with the angels, and with the beauty of heaven, and with all other believers for the rest of your life. So with nobody looking around, every eye closed, every head bowed, if you would like to give your heart to Jesus today, you want to ask for forgiveness of your sins. Maybe you, you've never done this before. Maybe you need to get things right with God today. And you've never done it before, or you're just unsure. Then I want to ask you to say this prayer with me. I'm going to have you repeat it after me. And everybody in the room will repeat it. But with nobody looking around, if you're willing to say that prayer, to ask Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, to ask him to forgive you, and you've never done it before or you're unsure of your salvation today, would you just raise your hand real high and say, I want to say that prayer. Okay, I don't see any hands right now, but keep your eyes closed, your head bowed. Everybody just repeat this prayer. Just say, Father God, I thank you for sending Jesus. And Jesus, today, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I need you to be my Lord and Savior. Come into my life. I believe that you died on the cross. I believe that they buried you. And on the third day, you rose from the dead. So today, forgive me of my sins. And I receive you as my Lord and Savior. And I receive your forgiveness. May I never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Praise God. Well, let's give it up to anybody who did give their heart. I'm not sure, uh, but I hope that you did. If you did. Uh, if you said that prayer, even if you didn't raise your hand, it's okay. If you said that prayer, be sure to pick up a little book that we've got out here at the Welcome Center. And again, I want to say, if you're a newer believer, like even if it's a month, two months, if it's a year and you're still like, man, I just, I just need to get some, some foundational teaching about Jesus and about the word and what all this is about, you need to go to Following Jesus every Monday night at seven o'clock in the room right next to this room. So I encourage you to grow. Grow, grow, grow. Get yourself ready, right? It's time to grow. All right, praise God. Pastor Brad, come on up. Come on.